All right, and we are live. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, or good evening, or good night, as the case may be. I am here, uh, as promised, with Betsy Habel again. Hi, Betsy. Hey, everyone. And I am looking forward to answering some more questions. We have a smaller list of questions today, but I think we've got some good ones. And um, and I know that uh, if we run out, I, I might have one or two. We might have one or two things to talk about anyway, uh, based, on, <laughs> based on some of our recent pairing sessions. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I think we'll have something to talk about. So let's see, what do we have here to start off with? Um, I'm going to share my screen to show the question. So the question here is about uh, a workflow class, which has multiple steps, uh, kind of a composed method pattern. And, um, and the question is, if we're, there's a step that needs to be implemented later, uh, I guess, how do we implement that? How do we handle that as we're building this step? Um, and I will say that I almost wish I had a little more information about this one. Um, I'm, I want to. I want to understand the scenario better, where we know that we have a step, an external step to call, but we don't have that step implemented yet. Yeah, um, because this feels very. It's depend. It depends. -y and also, right now, it's sufficiently abstract as a question that even though I'm sure it reflects something real, it feels artificial to me. And I'm always, I'm always wary of giving absolute answers to abstract questions because the chance that one is spouting bullshit when one <laughs> does that is very high. Yeah, very true. Um, but that said, you know, I think I've seen, I've come across code like this before. Um, and where I've come across issues, yeah. uh, issues like this before in working mm -hmm. with people and probably just on my own as well. Um, I will say that I don't usually find myself in this situation these days. Um, and I think the reason is, the reason kind of goes back to what I talked about a bit in the, um, the transaction script lesson, uh, which is that if I have something that's not implemented yet, the chances are I'm not going to say, oh, there's an external step that I need to call here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm more likely to say uh, that this is just step three. Um, and I think, so I think part of, part of the difference for me is that if I have a step that's not there yet, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, that's not like I'm nowhere near extracting it yet. Like I, I'm usually going to go through like putting it in line and then extracting it later if mm -hmm. if I feel like it. <clears throat> and if it's something that you're building to one of the ways I could potentially read this question um, is as someone trying to build something that they know will be extensible along this seam later, but they don't know how it will be extended yet. Um, and I think that in those cases, a null object is perfectly appropriate. Like what I'm visualizing here is something kind of out of um, Sandy Metz's bit on hook methods in practical object oriented design, um, where sometimes you'll know that you need to perform some post initialization steps. And so instead of having later, instead of having extending classes, call super deliberately, you can have them override a no-op method for after initialize. Right. Um, it's like the, I want to say the template method pattern. Yeah. Um, and there you can explicitly have a null object that is called for the step, or you can have just a empty method that doesn't do anything, um, right. which is your step three. Um, and yeah, um, 
this is the kind of thing where I try not to anticipate too much because anticipating anticipating is guessing and the chances of me guessing wrong are pretty high. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I think um, in these kinds of scenarios, what I typically do, like I think it's really reasonable if you're trying to make sure you remember all of the steps that are involved, uh, especially if you know that this is gonna be a multi-day development process. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really reasonable to have your step one, your step two, and your step three all there, even if they're not implemented. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as a reminder that like these are the things that we need to do. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, like I will often then just leave these things as empty methods and fill them in uh, as I get to them. Um, you know, so I'll I'll be going back to my tests and and adding some tests to make to force me to actually fill them in and then make that turn green by filling them in. Yeah. Um. So I guess I lean towards the leave implementation for later side of that question. Um, and then later on, I, I'll look at, um, I'll look at extraction. Oh, and this is, here's another point about code that looks like this. So like up to this point, I'm highlighting it. Hopefully it's, it's obvious or it's, it's reading. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, so this up to this point is, is like perfect, um, uh, compose method pattern, which is, which is something from from uh, small talk best practice patterns, where you have mm -hmm. like a series of uh, you break a process down into a series of methods that are all at the same level, and you have one top level method that is just literally just a series of of self sends, mm -hmm. and um, and I find that, that that pattern is really beautiful when you keep it consistent. So when it is literally just a series of self sends, a series of steps in the top level method. But as soon as something breaks the pattern, um, <laughs> that's that's where maintenance headaches crop up. And so like, this would be a red flag for me. Um, if I have a step mm -hmm. one, step two, and then custom step, you know, external object step three, like I would still, even if I know that I'm going to be extracting this, I would still have a step three method here. Um, and the extraction would be like behind that, behind that door. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, I feel like when you're doing, uh, <coughs> I feel like whenever you're doing like this kind of workflow class where you've got like this very organized series of steps, I wind up almost inevitably thinking about it a lot like the functional programming, um, railway oriented programming concept. Um, and what is that? Yeah. Yeah, um, so railway oriented programming is a technique for encapsulating stateful workflow processes um, in, God, I'm, I've been trying to explain this without using the word monad, but um, in, um, by using either monads um, and Monad is a scary word that people use to obscure things, but monads are really just boxes that you put something scary like state or asynchronicity in so that the rest of your um, code gets to pretend it's not scary. Um, it's another, the way I think about them a lot is that they're another form of encapsulation. Um, and, so in an either monad, you've got something that can return, that is either going one way or the other. Um, it's often called left or right, but in a railway oriented model, it's, yep, everything's fine. And nope, things have veered off the track, um, hence railway. Um, and so you've got this very defined series of steps here. You've got this set of steps and any of them can break. Um, is what's important to remember when you're looking at this. Like, if this is an actual process that's taking place in an actual Rails application, um, it's very unlikely that none of those steps, that my assumption about those steps is that some of them might make database calls, some of them might make network calls. Um, there's going to be all kinds of potential failures buried in them. And so when I see 
a consistent series of steps, I see potential for inserting a consistent mechanism for failure handling, much like the way that returning a wrong result in an either, like in this series of chained either monads suddenly veers you off onto the error handling track. Um, and when I see that pattern breaking, I see, oh, okay, all of a sudden, instead of handling errors in this, instead of handling disparate errors in a coherent way where we know that every error is going to go in a particular direction, we've opened the door to a hodgepodge of error handling techniques. And when I see a, that open door, I get very scared because error handling because people forget to do error handling in procedural code like this. And that never leads anywhere good. That's a really great point about the about error handling. I think, um, you know, I often look at code in terms of a cadence. Um, I look to see if it has it or if it doesn't have a, a cadence. And, uh, um, and if there is a cadence, whether there's there are parts of it that diverge from that. And, and mm -hmm. you're absolutely right that when you have the diverging parts, often it's like, oh, well, you know, it leads it leads you to to handling the errors in those parts differently. Um, having a, a consistent idiom for your error handling is a huge, huge win. Um, there's also a question here in, about um, using mocks for things that don't exist yet. Um, and that's true. I do often use mocks for things that don't exist yet. Um, I mean, yes, I would probably hide that extension point. Like I was saying, I would probably hide that behind a third step internally. Uh, but it's true that like, you know, if I know that I have these these three steps mm -hmm. um, and one of the steps is like send an email, well, I'm probably not going to get too low level with my email sending code in line because that's, if I already have three steps, clearly sending an email is, is a separate responsibility. Um, you know, and so it's, you know, I, I will often, as I'm, you know, as I get to the point where I want to drive out that email sending uh, capability, I'll say, okay, now, now this class can receive a, um, can receive a, you know, a, a service or something that can receive a, a thing which is capable of sending emails. And I expect that thing to receive a message. Yeah. I mean, we treat, we treat mocks like they're these special things for testing that are shrouded in mystery that people, that like you must know how to use correctly or something. Um, and when we use that like kind of internalized community definition of them, we miss out on the fact that there is not all that much difference between a mock and a null object. A yeah. mock is a specialized, most mocks like, if we're talking about partial stubbing and whatever, this isn't true anymore, but most mocks are just specialized null objects that happen to have some additional testing functionality on top of them. Right. Um, I, mean, I mean, a mock, ob I mean, a null object is just a, a, an object with defined null behavior and, and, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what test doubles do is they, they do nothing. It's just that you can ask them afterwards, did you do nothing or did you not do nothing? <laughs> Did somebody um, tell you to do nothing? And sometimes that's a really important thing to test, right? Like, if you know, I'm struggling to come up with a concrete situation where this would happen, but if you know that there's going to be a step three for consumers of this class that they dependency inject, and you know that whatever that is is important to call, but you don't know what the details of it are, then Yes, you do want your tests for the class to verify that whatever it is is called. Um, yeah. So hopefully that um, that answers that question, or at least provides some extra food for thought. Um, uh, there's another question. The next question here is one I don't need to put on screen. It's quite short, um, but it's a great question. Um, Here's a question I've used to divide teams of Ruby programmers with hours of disagreement. Should domain objects persist themselves? And boy, um, you, <laughs> that, that question actually reminded me um, 
So as, as, as you all know, uh, a lot of the, you know, most of the actual lesson material in this course is de derived from uh, Ruby Tapas episodes that I've done in the past. And uh, I did a four episode series on why opposites why should not save themselves and <laughs> why they should not persist themselves. And uh, um, I'm actually wondering now whether I should expand the course a little bit and include that series in it because it's a, it's, it follows on from some of the stuff we'll be talking about with, with um, process objects a little later. Um, but uh, before I go into like a summary of my, of, of why I think uh, there are problems with, with saving. Uh, Betsy, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. Um, And my thoughts are kind of influenced by two basic threads, um, and I'm going to like reference points more more or less. Um, and I'm going to briefly explain them so that I can have my reaction, or so that I can have those things out on the table when I react to them. Um, and one of them is Eric Evans's book, Domain Driven Design, which I brought up before, and I'm sure I'll bring up again, um, which lays out a very specific um, series of patterns, one of which is, or among other things, lays out a specific series of patterns for dealing with the problem of what Evans calls entity objects. Um, and so these are going to be things roughly equivalent to your average Rails model. Things, uh, anything that has its own unique identifier and a sense of identity that persists through time. So um, an individual user, an, um, an individual blog post, um, a unit um, and an inventory management system, things like that. Um, and Evans very strongly feels that when you're dealing with entities, you should nearly always have an accompanying factory and an accompanying repository. And the repository is for marshalling entities to and from or for marshalling entities to and from the persistence layer and the factory is for assembling entities partly in concert with a repository possibly from scratch um, so that all of the constituent parts of the entity are aligned correctly and this is great and as someone who has worked on a lot of large rails projects that could perhaps have really benefited from this pattern um i was really hyped for it when i first started hearing about it but around the same time i was also playing with the framework um hanami um i think it was still called lotus at that point um but it's called hanami now which doesn't follow these ideas exactly, but which follows some similar ideas around um, this multi-part structure for assembling entities so that entities could be their own thing, their own domain object, that was very separate from any persistence layer funkiness. Um, and what I found was that I still found the idea attractive, but that I found the amount of machinery and boilerplate that Hanami's implementation required to be absolutely infuriating on small applications. Um, <laughs> And so 
where I've kind of landed from that is that the ways that having domain objects able to persist themselves render a system more intuitive and at least potentially less boilerplate -y are really valuable. And so even though having a separate structure to handle or not handle persistence um, can be incredibly valuable as application complexity grows. You do need to also consider what you're losing when you go that direction. Mm. Um, that's kind of where I've landed. That makes sense. And and your answer has has uh, reminded me that there are actually sort of two variations on this question, at least, um, which is one, should objects have the capability of saving themselves? And two, mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. objects save themselves as part of their processing? You know, as part, you know, you tell, you tell a, um, an object to do something and then as a side effect of it doing that thing, um, You know, like you have a, a a sweepstakes, and and you have different entrants, and you tell one of the entrants that they've won the entrant objects that they've won. Should it just change, update the object in memory, or should it then also write itself to to the database to record the fact that they've won? Mm -hmm. um, so those are those are, I guess, two variations on this question. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on the second variation, which is, um, you know, I, I I guess I have limited thoughts on the first variation, like. I can, like you, like you, I can see arguments both for completely separating the the process of persistence, mm -hmm. the, the concern of persistence from the the business models. Um, but there's a reason that the active record pattern exists, you know, separate and 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 prior to the active record library in in Rails, which is that often it is simply expedient. In many scenarios, it is simply expedient to have that behavior built into the objects. Um, mm -hmm. at least for a certain type of, of application development. And so, you know, it, it depends, I think, is my answer there. Now, when it comes to um, whether objects should save themselves as a byproduct of their logic, um, I tend to come down on, on no. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to really prefer, like, tell an object to update itself and then explicitly tell it to save itself. And... I, like I said, I went through and I came up with a lot of reasons for that um, because uh, a while back I got a lot of questions about that. And some of the, I'm, I'm just kind of cribbing from my own uh, notes mm -hmm. here, but, but some of the, the issues that I've seen with that, um, having objects that save themselves as a byproduct of what they're doing, for one thing, uh, okay, you've immediately lost any, any isolation testing. You can't, you can't test your object without a database or something that pretends to be a database. Um, which you know is not the end of the world, but it's something to be aware of, um, which uh, can really lead to slow test suites. And it's not just like the simple, mm -hmm. the simple case of yes, saving things to the database leads to a slow test test suite. You run into stuff where like object A that you're testing has a depend, like when when you construct it, when you use your your factory or whatever to construct it for your tests, it's got like three instances of object B attached to it, and if every single one of them saves itself separately as a as a side effect of processing, um, you have mm -hmm. now you have a really slow test suite mm -hmm. because they're doing individual saves. You're not you're not um, you know bundling up these saves into one big save. Um, a lot of my objections with this really come down to like um, the ideal to me with especially with web application development is you get a request, you load all the the data in that you need to handle that request. Uh, you do a bunch of processing, and then you save everything in one shot. And that's, I mean, that's the ideal. It's not always possible. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, database transactions can help make it that way, even when that's not the way your code works, but there, there are often issues with that. Um, and, um, and so, like, for me, the ideal is that, like, load, process, save, sequence without a lot of extraneous, a lot of little saves along the way. Um, and um, 
So another one, oh yeah, here's a really good one. So add it, so validations with, with Active Record and Rails, validations really become an issue here because uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. Because like <laughs> you have so okay, you have a whole bunch of tests that as a byproduct of testing your object, they happen to save it because the object saves itself along the way. Fine, they work, it's you know, everything's fine. Now somebody adds a new validation. Suddenly, 20 of your tests are failing, not because you broke any functionality, uh-huh. but because you've tightened up the validations and and you know all of your your tests set up for those objects didn't set them up in a valid state or something and and so now you have to go through and you have to fix your tests because they're all failing because of a, a completely unrelated validation update so that's Which another is issue also really risky actually because sometimes because sometimes the reason that they st- your tests start failing is that you shouldn't have the validation there in the first place um yeah. <laughs> as I went, as I discovered to my sadness in um, a RailsConf talk that I think I've already plugged in <laughs> the forums. Which you no, definitely like, check out. No, um, like one of the things I'm thinking about here, and this is where I get very it dependsy, and I promise I'm not, so like, this is where I get very it dependsy because for, 90% of applications, I really, really want to have this unsullied, you load the data up from the database, you make some changes to it, you push the data back to the database, and it's this very atomic thing. But there are circumstances in which things can get more complex more rapidly, um, often scaling related. Um, And sometimes that can be scaling in the sense of, validations are actually a great example here. If you have in-memory validation as opposed to database-driven validation, along uniqueness constraints, you're setting yourself up for a bad time in certain kinds of scaling situations. Um, Because what you think is unique right now, and because you can get like a situation in which, unless you're specifically locking um, the ID or whatever other unique attribute you want. Um, at the beginning of the transaction, you can get contention for the resource of that unique ID because multiple simultaneous transactions can be referencing it, which is fine, but like something to be aware of. Uh, another case where my ideal pattern just did not work was a situation where we really did need to use like materialized views in based off of Postgres triggers for particular reason. So like basically the more and more you're relying on your database's logic, the riskier and riskier um, separating your domain logic from your database logic gets. Um, And in general, I would prefer to keep most of my application logic in memory rather than subject to database rules in Ruby applications, because that boundary is so painful to cross for so many reasons. Mm. But Also, there are circumstances where I can't afford to do that. And and I'm also, I think probably if I were using like some kind of JVM run database where that boundary were easy to cross, I wouldn't necessarily hold the same opinions, although I don't know about that. Interesting. Yeah, that's, it's, it's important um, to remember that like a lot of our, a lot of our, development preferences 
mm-hmm. often stem from the limitations of the environments that they're that we're used to rather oh, yeah. than universal things and that's worth um knowing. and like I'm no longer at the job where I needed to deal with the materialized view stuff because the development processes at Forest were so antithetical to how I like to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, so even though I really liked the product and much of the rest of the team, I just wasn't. It, it, yeah. My tests were always slow and I couldn't cope. <laughs> 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 so like, and that's fine. That's fine for everyone involved. Yeah. I'm going to put up my uh, my screen again just so I can share the list that I'm I'm cribbing off of, um, which was my final list of all the reasons that self uh, ha- having an object save itself as a byproduct can can be problematic. Um, unnecessarily slow batch jobs. This is a biggie, and this is this is an example of of test pain actually presaging a, a production pain. Mm-hmm. So what happens here is you have some little action. That that as a byproduct of the action, you know, you tell an object to go through a state change, and then it saves itself as a at, at the end of that save state change. Perfectly normal thing to do. Um, and you have individual, you know, people people performing this action as part of individual HTTP requests, and everything's fine. But then one day you decide you need to do a great big import, you know, ten thousand rows from CSV, and um, and you want to reuse the code that you already had for doing this process, whatever the state change is, you need to do it for every single one of the one of the new objects. You need to create them and then go through this state change. And um, and because the code is written the way it is, um, you know, they're saving themselves as a byproduct of the state change. And suddenly you have this incredibly slow batch job that because it's doing save, 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 save with every single one. And, and you, since you've, like, you've hard-coded that decision, there's no easy way to say, OK, in this case, we're going to just queue up a list of all the objects that need to be saved. And we're going to do one big batch save at the end. Um, it's, you know, or we're going to do chunking or something. Uh, there's no way to easily, you have to actually go in and figure out the implications of updating the code in order to avoid that slowdown. So that's another issue I've seen. Um, and this is actually, I think a lot of these I got because, um, mm-hmm. you know, some of these I'd seen myself and some of them I, I actually solicited. Mm-hmm. I went out and asked people like, what are all your stories of of issues with self-saving in, um, in, in Rails apps? Um, after save hooks, uh, I'm not going to go into detail on that one, but you can probably just imagine uh, some of the issues that you run into with, you know, if you have saving that's part of your your domain logic, well, once you add an after save hook, that's attached to that domain logic, whether it was anticipated or not. And this is where stuff like circular calls sometimes come in and, and all kinds of weirdness. Um, transactions can be an issue both ways. Um, you know, I've seen issues with with something that no longer worked once you put it in the context of a larger transaction because it was saving itself. And I've seen other issues where something um, it had an implied dependency on being inside a transaction, that save being inside a transaction. And suddenly when you executed it in the absence of one, um, it no longer works. That's amazing, and I really want to see that example so I can marvel at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but uh, it was definitely it was it was real. Um, I don't know, maybe I actually I have these. Oh up my gosh! See if I can find it. Um, oh. I think it had to do with error handling. One way to kind of get at something else here is, like, I don't think I think that when you start getting into the very tight coupling between database and application code that I was talking about earlier, object coherency is likely to throw out, to be thrown out the window anyway. So 
self-saving is not the only, or so like self-saving and objects is kind of worth talking a little bit about actually. Mm. Um, and I'm going to drop a link in chat um, called feral concurrency control, which is a, among other things, a terrifying con condemnation of validates, unique, of validates uniqueness of in Rails. Um, oh dear, it's not letting me paste it in. Oh yeah. Cute, uh, it's um they they don't like URLs in in the chats I guess but you can um let's uh, in get into the Q and A yeah let's get in the Q and A thread and I do want to say um so there's a good comment here um in the live chat um, Bodon says that in Active Record you can save save or save bang depending on a situation but a save is part of an update process you can't choose anymore and that's another great yeah. point is that yeah, yeah. you know sometimes sometimes we want the save semantics sometimes we want the save bang semantics. But if there's a side effect, you know, if some some sub call down, you know, down the stack is also causing a save, uh, we don't get to choose anymore. We don't get to say, well, all of the saves should be optional in this, in this, or all of the saves should be should be, be uh, exception raising. So yeah, that's that's another great point. Um, so yeah, I'm not a huge fan of. Of objects saving themselves as byproducts. Um, I much prefer to see, you know, create, load or create an object, then uh, tell it to do something, then tell it to save itself in a, in a controller. And hopefully any objects that are sort of, you know, that are part of that object's tree, uh, what's the, what's the mm -hmm. uh, term in domain-driven design? Um, aggregate? Uh, aggregate, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, it's set up so that anything that depends on that or anything attached to that object is going to get saved as a byproduct of telling like the top level object yes. save yourself. And this is why another reason that I really like having objects to rep top level objects to represent uh, a process, you know, a business process, because then you can have that that process be the top level object that you tell it, okay, now that the process is done, save yourself anything that was changed at, along the the along the course of that process or along the course of that state change is going to get saved as well. <laughs> Let's see, what else do we have question-wise? This next one's kind of chewy. Uh, this one here? Um. Yeah, I'm also noticing a chance to. I, I'll I'll definitely at least answer um, Pedro's question in comments because I have feelings about view code <laughs> conditionals. Um, but anyway, carry on. Focusing on, on Ross's question for now. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, so services and perform methods, and they call other services, and they are large, procedural, and complex. I'm tr having trouble tr keep keeping it all in my head, let alone knowing where to start looking for an abstraction. Um, and it's grown to a point where it's difficult to manage. Finding the seams in code that has been written procedurally so that you can find those hidden objects. Uh, so and then I'm we have another good question after that. But yeah, let's start, <laughs> with, start with the first part. So I'm going to make a semi-informed wild guess here, um, which is based on my experience with the exact kind of many procedure tree that Ross is describing, which is that nearly inevitably, um, the same parameters wind up getting passed down through the tree. Um, sometimes this is going to take the form of objects that everything in the tree depends on. Some of this is going to take the form of you need a specific options hash like three layers deep and so everything needs to pass that options hash down to that layer um things like that there's going to be these little knots um where um parameters where you get something that's passed through in concert with something else, where you get something that's passed down the tree, where you get um, 
the same two or three parameters always passed in concert. Um, I think I said that already. Um, where within one of these large procedure objects, you see methods with the same, with similar names a lot, et cetera. Like, if you look at it, you're going to see some kind of pattern where the same thing happens a lot. And that is what an object that is struggling to get out looks like. That is, yeah, that is so true. I completely agree with that. I think if you're looking for those seams, or if you're looking for, you know, where to pull objects out, looking for those uh, data clumps, as, as Sam Livingston Gray points out in the mm -hmm. live chat, uh, is a fantastic place to start. A lot of times I think it, it what it reveals is that it's like we've sliced the wrong way. Like there's slices mm -hmm. in this application. It's just that they're horizontal instead of vertical or something. You know, it's like when... <laughs> When I, mm -hmm. when I give a, a, a sandwich, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to one of my kids, and they're like, no, it's wrong. I'm like, why? It's got peanut butter and jelly, just like you asked. They're like, the, it's square. You sliced it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I'll say about this is that having a development environment that can do the inline method refactoring easily mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, for this, this is the reason that I, especially in large legacy code bases, I often spend a lot of my time in RubyMine instead of some other editor because it has some of these refactorings built in. It's in a sufficient, in a way that's sufficiently easy to hand uh, that I don't, you know, that I can just say, I want to try this and see what it looks like. And uh, for me, for me having, um, Finding the objects for me also often starts with like with defactoring. Like I can't even think about it right. Like those the objects that are there bias me so hard. They yeah. make it so hard for me to see any other design trying to to climb out that I just can't. I can't even. Um, and so I have to I have to go through and do inline method and just you know dump that code that that's often a service into the inline procedure. And then once I have that all in there, uh, then I can sort of go down it and I start, I start, can start like separating things out into stanzas, um, occasionally putting comments to myself and start thinking about how, you know, whether there's an alternate way of fitting things together. I'm the same way. Defactoring is so, cause it's then, So a lot of the time I want my code in small methods and small classes so that I don't need to think about very much of it at once. But that's a specific trade-off that's being made. It's a trade-off that I'm making because I want to be able to focus on this piece here now rather than thinking about the whole thing at once. But if this whole but if I have this whole pile of math of mess that's factor drawn. I don't want to be thinking about it as individual little bits and pieces. I want to be thinking about it as the entire thing. Um, and so defactoring gives me the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I strongly, when I'm working with people on code bases like that, I strongly advise them uh, not to get to a state where they're not too biased by the existing mm -hmm. organization. So um, the second part of that question <laughs> is, is for Betsy. Um, and it's a great question. Uh, I'd love to hear a, about how your work as a theatrical set designer informed or influenced your work as a programmer. Um, so I gave a talk at RubyConf recently about just this. And I'm going to drop a link in the show notes. Um, and or not the show notes, but like the um, in um, the discourse thread. The, but the thread, yeah. Um, But going on a tack that I didn't cover in that talk, um, one of the things that I really, really got out of it was a 
<laughs> um, was something that my uh, mentor in theater um, had reduced to a saying, which is that done is the highest form of art. Um, variations that she also used included, the paint will be dry on opening night. Um, but like this sense of, After a certain point, you're going to release this thing out into the world and you're still, and there's going to be 3 million things that you are unhappy about in it. There are going to be 3 million things that you notice and care about that you wish were better. But Obsessing over that prevents you from either doing the work or accepting the parts of the work that you've done well. Um, and theater's really great for teaching you not to obsess over that because no matter what you do and how hard you try, there is going to be something that you're just kind of frantically fiddling with, um, with a table in your head of how fast this particular kind of paint will take to dry up until the last possible minute, and you're not going to quite finish it and the audience isn't going to care, even if you do. <laughs> so there's that. That seems like a really important lesson for software design. I, you know, I had made the weirdest connection when you were talking about that. I don't know if this even makes sense at all. I don't mm -hmm. know why I thought of this particular thing. I guess because it's, it re it reminded me a little of set design, but um, have you ever heard of the mo the the movie The Adventures of Baron von Munchausen? Uh, yes. Uh, so it's a, a film by by Terry Gilliam who makes these really trippy movies, mm -hmm. and well, it was one of his earlier films. Um, and, and it, his movies tend to be uh, artistically they they have a lot of ambition. Uh, and, and Munchausen was, a, was famously a, a disaster of production. Um, but there's this, this sequence towards the end where they find their way on the, to the moon. And on the moon, there are these cities which are portrayed as just like a bunch of like paper drawings uh, or like two-dimensional prints of buildings that are constantly moving around, like coming forwards and backwards and stuff like that. Um, and it's a very surreal bit of filmmaking. Uh, and I read the story of that one once, which was that they just ran out of money. <laughs> like they had, you know, there was a completely different, um, there was a completely different idea for how the moon was going to look. And, and they ran out of money. So they printed a bunch of stuff on paper and they did this really surreal thing, which works as a really surreal thing, but it just made me think, you know, like, or time or money. No, um, like constraints are good actually. Yeah. Um, like the fact that, okay, so in Rails you can break the seven action controller pattern all you please. I think it's usually a bad idea, but you can. But if you choose to accept that as a hard constraint, it will tell you so much about domain objects you didn't even realize you had until you started looking at things in terms of, okay, but how can I turn this complex process into a bunch of nouns that can be operated on with this basic set of rest verbs? Um, there was a design that I'm still incredibly proud of for a show 
about the Occupy movement that was constrained by the fact that I had a hundred dollars to spend. Everything needed to be disassemblable and reassemblable in 15 minutes and everything needed to fit when disassembled in the director's car because with the DC Fringe Fest, sometimes you get lucky on your space, on the rules of the space you get assigned to, and sometimes you really don't. <laughs> um, but it worked um, because you can make a joke about how it worked because of course, of course it worked. It was about the Occupy movement. So of course everything was just kind of thrown together. But that's also true in a non-joking sense, like needing to think about ambient materials that could fit in my director's car really, and that I could get donated, um, really helped me ground the play in, in specific ways um, and made a better set than I might have been able to make without that constraint. That's a good point. I guess the so like the constraints that we deal with in software. I mean, time. I guess is the big one. What are some of the other ones? You mentioned like the seven action controller. That's um, a great point. Time latency, the cap theorem. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes it's it's the familiar. What are what our team members are familiar with. Oh yeah, that's a really good one. Like what's gonna be a little too too far beyond the pale? Or what do we what do we feel confident we have the skills to operate on our team? Because there are places where it's appropriate to go off into the wilds of writing your own scary distributed system stuff. And there's places where it's really much more appropriate to go, I will pay Amazon for that. Right. <laughs> and that's fine. Yeah. Well, um, we're getting up to the, to the hour mark. Um, do you have uh, time for this one last question? Yeah. Let me put this up on the screen. This came in, um, I think, as we were doing this. And you said you had thoughts. Uh, so let's see, what are we talking about here? We're talking about <laughs> conditionals in views. Um, lots of conditionals in views. And whether it's a good idea to have logicless views. It depends on what you mean by logicless views because people mean a lot of different things like that. Or by that, um, in general, I try to work towards a style in which there is a minimum of logic in my views, and most of the things. And most of the code is a derivation of properties on the very limited list of objects I am supplying to the view. Um, but that's something that I am able to do because my toolkit for turning things into objects is larger than a lot of other people's. And so view, sorry, I'm going to back up a second. So view code is really interesting because view code is the place where the assumptions that the coders who came before you, who might be you four months ago, or who might be some entirely different team four years ago, um, the assumptions that they made 
collide the worst with the assumptions that the users are actually have the, the assumptions that actual users actually have because the views are where the UI is expressed. And so the views are where it's easiest to kind of try to shim over a disconnect between those two mental models um, by adding a conditional. And so we often try to kind of deepen the spackle by going for decorator patterns. Um, but what I tend to prefer to do well, it kind of starts the same way. It kind of starts with factoring toward a decorator object, but then I start, but I try to keep the decorator object relatively free of view markup um, and kind of defer that to partials. And then I start to ask myself, is this decorator object actually a, a model that I didn't know about before? Because 90% of the time it is. Um, like 90% of the time, what I, what starts out being a decorator because that's the easiest thing to factor out of a messy view is actually an entirely domain, new domain concept that was obvious to my users, but not to me. Hmm. Mind blown. That's a really good point. I almost wish we could forget a, get an example of that into the course. Now that's a really good point. Well, um, I think that uh, I think that brings us to the end of our list of questions for today. Um, and I didn't even get a chance to ask you how you feel about static typing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just have to save that one for an, for a slow day. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Betsy, as always, it's been great to great to talk to you, and thank you so much for for joining me for this session. Hope everybody as enjoyed. Always. It. Um, oh, make sure you and make sure you drop a, a link to uh, the the best version, like your favorite version of that talk, uh, in the Q and A thread for this, because I definitely want to make sure that people could see that. Will do. All right. Well, um, until the next Q and A. See y'all later. See y'all later.